Right, well, welcome everyone to this Archer 2 webinar. Uh, today we have uh, Oliver Brown, the EPCC in-house expert on quantum computing, uh, telling us about uh, simulating quantum computing on classical computers. Um, take it away, Oliver. Hey, uh, thanks for that, Julian, and uh, welcome everyone. Um, yeah, as you said, we're going to be talking about uh, what I've described as quantum computing without a quantum computer. Um, now, just to say, the uh, bulk of this talk is me trying to explain why this is a hard problem. Uh, and then there's a few slides at the end showing what, what we have been able to achieve using Archer 2. Um, if you do have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat. Uh, I'll try and keep an eye on that and try and answer questions as they come up. And then there uh, hopefully should be time for questions at the end. Uh, in fact, I haven't had a chance to go through and practice this talk, so there might actually be loads of time at the end for questions. Um, and yes, uh, Julian's helpfully pointed out where the chat is, in case you're not too familiar with Blackboard. Um, and yeah, so in general as well, I should say I've tried to explain the sort of minimum amount of quantum computing um, to show why this is a difficult problem. The reason being that it's uh, a really quite a big, big area. <laughs> and uh, I think this talk would be far too long. Uh, if it did go into details, but um, so I might gloss over some things, but feel free to ask uh, for more information. If it's during the talk, I might um, promise to respond with more detail later, depending on what the question is. But let's uh, let's crack on. Um, so the introduction here really is that you know, we are quantum computing is coming, um, and in fact, arguably, if you work at the likes of uh, Regetti or Google or IBM or Honeywell, uh, it's already here because these people make quantum computers. Um, but I work at EPCC, and we don't have one. And <laughs> um, here, just for effect, I've got some photos of, of Google Sycamore quantum processor. This is the current record holder in terms of number of qubits. Uh, I'll talk about uh, a bit about what a qubit is very shortly. Um, but that has 53 qubits, uh, and it was used to show some quantum advantage on uh, what many would argue is a toy example in the the um, example that they showed uh, of something that was easy to do on a quantum computer and really hard to do on a classical computer was to simulate a randomly chosen uh, quantum circuit. <laughs> okay, but you know it it worked. Uh, the technology is all there, and you can see on the left we have um, a picture of the actual processor itself, uh, and it's tiny. And then the thing you can see on the right is the huge cryostat that goes around it to keep it. Um, cooled to extremely low temperatures um, of sort of tens of Kelvin or even millikelvin, uh, depending on the precise hardware implementation. I think, uh, so this is a superconducting qubit quantum computer, and I think that means millikelvin temperatures, um, but don't trust my word for that. Okay, but uh, from EPCC's perspective, um, We've always been interested in uh, applying novel compute um, to uh, to new problems uh, or even old problems. Um, and we can see that quantum computing, although it's not widely available yet, um, is there on the horizon. And now is the time for us to be paying attention to see how we might be able to make use of it in the future. Um, and that's really where um, the kind of work I've been doing and that I'll be showing in this talk has come in. Okay. So first of all, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, classical computing, actually. Uh, and we're going to talk about classical bits. So uh, programmers uh, such as myself uh, and many of my colleagues have an abstract model of the hardware in which the problems are executed. Um, and in fact, actually, we have lots of them, depending on the high level features of the hardware. So a lot of the research work that I'm involved in the EPCC is around programming models, where we look at uh, how you program a computer that has, say, lots of memory and many cores, uh, or lots of different nodes, uh, and then we use message passing programming, uh, or indeed, how would we make use of a computer that has GPUs or FPGAs uh, plugged into it as well? Uh, and these are all very high level abstractions we use, um, or rather, the tools that we're developing there and that we're uh, investigating there make use of high level abstractions for those kind of hardware features that the programmer can have access to. Um, but they do it in such a way that the programmer hopefully doesn't have to add too much to their code to make use of them, or indeed to be able to change it to a different uh, hardware platform. 
the point is this is sort of 70 years worth of research and development to get to this stage um, you know and as i say programming models are uh, very much an ongoing uh, area of research especially when we look towards um, exascale computing in the future um, but the very lowest level uh, of all this we have the concept of a bit okay and we build data types on bits and data structures on data types so a data type might be an integer or a floating point number um, and then data structures can be built out of of those low level types depending on the programming language but all these things are ultimately implemented uh, as sequences of bits okay zeros or ones um, and that's the kind of what the hardware has that allows computation to happen but as a software developer i importantly do not care how a bit is actually implemented now in my past life as a physicist uh, i could tell you that you know in fact most modern computers use something called a complementary metal oxide semiconductor to implement uh, transistors, which then implement bits and logic gates. But um, from a programmer's or software developer's perspective, it, it really doesn't matter. All we need to know is that there is some kind of physical system at the very bottom of our machine um, that can be in a state zero or a state one. Uh, and as long as that's the case, we can program with it. And we have all these other abstractions we can use to program on top of that. Uh, physical hardware. Now, when it comes to quantum computing, okay, we have a bit of a problem because this very lowest level uh, abstraction that we have, the bit changes. Okay, so instead of a classical bit, we have a quantum bit, usually referred to as a qubit, uh, which you remember I said earlier, the Sycamore processor from Google has 53 of. Um, now, where a classical bit has two states, usually referred to as zero and one, uh, a qubit has two states, usually referred to as zero and one, uh, in funny brackets. Uh, we'll go a little bit into that later. This is called Dirac notation. Um, but importantly, there's a thing in quantum physics called the superposition principle. And what that says is that uh, you can form a valid quantum state from any uh, linear sum uh, or superposition of those two qubit states. Um, we've got the, the math for this here at the bottom, which is the psi equals alpha zero plus beta one. What that really means is that um, the state 0 0.50 plus 0 0.51 is just as valid uh, and physically realizable as the state zero or one. Um, and indeed, this is true for any combination of, of those two states. And alpha and beta are also complex numbers as well. Um, because there's a kind of phase that we associate with these numbers. Um, so one way to represent this that's commonly used is this image I've got on the left, which is the block sphere. And actually any state on the surface uh, of that block sphere is a valid, uh, represents a valid qubit state. Um, indeed, actually there is uh, a physical meaning to states within the block sphere as well. Um, but whereas with a classical bit, you're locked into either zero or one, uh, with the quantum bits, you can be any of these things. Um, and I think through this talk, we'll show that this is both a blessing and a curse. But yeah, it, the key takeaway, I think, is that uh, our entire view of computing as we know it has to change when it comes to quantum computing, because we've, we've ripped away the very bottom of our uh, sort of layers of abstraction and replaced it with something new. Um, and you know, there's going to be a lot of work, I think, to to get back to where we are with classical computing um, with quantum computing. Okay, so a little bit more about superposition. You might be thinking to yourself, well, how on earth does that work? Um, oh, ah, so uh, David, one of my colleagues has asked, uh, or says that he doesn't understand how you can get a state within the sphere uh, since surely it's normalized. Uh, and you're absolutely right, David. Uh, it should be unless you are dealing with open quantum systems uh which is to say systems where energy is lost from the system often physicists like to deal with closed systems where we just assume that everything stays exactly as we uh, initialized it uh, until we touch it or do something with it or apply a force but in open quantum quantum systems you assume that actually there's some environment that interacts with the system that uh, data is lost to and what can happen there is you end up um, in a, a mixed state which 
so if you don't renormalize anyway, um, you can end up in a, a mixed state where, which is right at the very center, for example, and that is a, a qubit that's been completely decohered. Um, so you've lost all the information that was encoded in that qubit, and you're now stuck in the center of that sphere. And actually, this is used as one uh, possible measure for um, the amount of uh, the amount of decoherence in a system, uh, called the BLP measure. Yes, okay. So it does as the assumed a closed system, which is a very reasonable example. And I should say that most of the time that is exactly uh, you know the approach we would take. So I sort of mentioned it uh, because I think it's interesting, but for the most part you can only where you only have to worry about the states on the surface of the sphere, and particularly when it comes to quantum computing. Um, but there is an actual uh, physical meaning assigned to states within the sphere as well. Uh, so thanks, that's a good question. Okay, uh, so yes, back to um, superposition. You might be wondering how does that work? Uh, and the answer is, of course, that it depends on the physical implementation, which we're trying not to worry about too much. But uh, just as an example, um, we can think of polarized light, um, which is used in uh, QKD, which is quantum key distribution. This is one of the um, uh, sort of fairly important, actually, um, sort of proven applications of, of, of uh, quantum systems, really. It's not quantum computing, but um, you know, quantum physics to a real world problem. And that quantum key distribution can be used to uh, distribute uh, sort of cryptographic keys in such a way that you can be absolutely sure that no one has uh, intercepted them, which is you know, nice. Um, but the way that the these systems tend to work is they use uh, optics or quantum optics. Uh, so you have photons which are polarized either vertically or horizontally, and this means exactly what you, you might suspect in that uh, either the light wave is uh, oscillating up and down or side to side as it travels through space. Uh, obviously, you need to define yourself <laughs> what counts as up and down and what counts as side to side. And therein really uh, lies the problem. You can have diagonally polarized light that is actually a combination of those two things. Um, and then that looks like an even superposition of, of both these states uh, when we measure it. Um, so there's a, a relatively simple, <laughs> hopefully, um, example of, of how superposition can be physically realized. But again, as good quantum software developers, we try not to worry about it. We just we know that this is true and can be the case, uh, and we, we work from there. Now, equally crucially, the superposition principle applies to many body states just as well as it does individual qubits. Um, so what that means is you can have a state like this one at the bottom, phi plus, which is uh, 1 over root 2. And that 1 over root 2 is just a normalization factor. Um, so you'll find that if you take the square of this, you end up with, with one. Um, but uh, yeah, one over root two, zero, zero plus one, one. So what that means, or what that uh, implies is that there are two qubits and that overall the system of two qubits is in an even superposition state of the zero, zero state. So both qubits in the zero state and the one, one state where both qubits are in the, in the one state. Um, Okay, and you know, again, the same uh, implication is there that any combination of any of the four states that actually this the system could be in um, is a completely valid physical state, and therefore something that uh, you know when we're looking at emulating a quantum computer, we need to keep track of, and we'll we'll come back to that. Okay, but the superposition principle is a, a key part of of quantum physics and the theory of quantum physics. Um, that is very important to quantum computing. Now, we're going to move on to <laughs> entanglement. Um, and I've got sort of the obligatory XKCD here, uh, which is relating to um, quantum teleportation, which is a, a protocol that makes use of entanglement and is nowhere near as exciting as it initially sounds. Um, because it's a way of transferring information, but unfortunately not matter. So, you know, we don't have Star Trek style uh, teleporters um, through this, but we can send information this way. Um, but entanglement itself, that state that I just uh, talked about, this one over root two zero zero plus one one, you know, has this other interesting property in that it is maximally entangled. Uh, it's one of the four Bell states. 
uh, which are all maximally entangled. Um, and I, I don't want to go too much into this because I think understanding entanglement is uh, is difficult, uh, as is explaining it. Uh, and it would be an entire talk to itself where I to try. Um, but the key point from the, the perspective of how do we emulate quantum computers, uh, knowing that quantum systems have this property, that they can be entangled, um, is that entangled states are not separable. So uh, you can see here at the bottom, this Bell state, phi plus, uh, cannot uh, be recreated by any kind of um, product of two individual states, okay? Because uh, any time I do that, you know, I need both a zero and a one state from my first and second qubit to be involved somehow. But then I'm going to have these crossover states included as well, zero and one and one zero. Um, and obviously they're missing from the, this particular superposition state that we've got. Um, and there's no way to, to make that mass work, right? So you cannot write this Bell state as a product of two of the two qubit states individually. Uh, you have to write it as its own separate thing. Uh, and the implication for us is that we can't easily or really compress our representation of, of quantum states um, because not only is any linear combination valid, um, but actually some of them can only be represented with a full representation of the system. Um, and again, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, shortly. Okay, but uh, so entanglement is another key property. Uh, and there is also some evidence that you know the fact that entanglement is a feature of quantum systems is one of the reasons why quantum computing has the potential um, to give us an advantage over um, classical computing. I'm very purposely avoiding too much talk about uh, quantum advantage and what that means uh, in this talk. Um, because EPCC is a, a practical um, computing center, right? And the fact is that uh, at the moment, because we don't have quantum computers in a, in a widespread way, it's very difficult to, to quantify what advantage you might get for any given application, um, because you have to rely on complexity arguments. And so you can show that an algorithm um, has much better scaling properties uh, than a classical one, but that may not mean anything depending on how we physically have to implement it. You know, that doesn't necessarily translate into actual speed up. Um, so I think that one of the key things I want you to take away from this talk, if anything, um, is that uh, when talking about quantum computers, one should be careful to avoid the hype. Um, you know, there is a lot of potential there, but it is still potential at the moment. And I think what's most exciting about working in this field right now is the fact that we can explore where it might be useful um, and indeed find out where it isn't going to be useful. OK, um, so the final kind of property of, of quantum physics that I want to discuss uh, is measurement. Um, and this is uh, perhaps the most infamous feature of, of quantum physics because of the um, Schrodinger's cat uh, thought experiment, where in uh, it said that there is a cat in a box with a uh, poison that may or may not go off. Um, and the question is, you know, when you close the box, is the cat both alive and dead because the poison may have gone off or may not have? Now, uh, there's a couple of things I want to say when I bring up Schrodinger's cat. First of all, um, no cats were harmed. It is entirely a thought experiment. And second of all, it was uh, actually a thought experiment that was brought up specifically to discredit quantum physics. Um, you know, and to say, well, this is clearly complete rubbish because it doesn't work. Now, nowadays, with the benefit of 100 years worth of, of research since then, um, what we can say is that the reason that Schrodinger's cat is, is rubbish is that uh, a cat is such a large system that it behaves entirely classically. OK, uh, it's not sufficiently isolated from its environment, uh, so we don't see any quantum effects and we wouldn't expect to. Um, so you cannot have a cat in a superposition state in the same way that you can a single photon or indeed four or 10 or 20 photons um, or electrons or other quantum particles. Um, yeah. But uh, the point really about 
measurement in quantum systems is the result of a measurement on any single qubit is always going to be either zero or one. Uh, or you might say the cat is either going to be dead or alive. Um, now, if we go back to our first state that I uh, gave you, um, alpha zero plus beta one, completely generic uh, single qubit state, this would be measured in the state zero or one with the probability alpha squared or beta squared respectively. So in fact, if I go back to David's question earlier where he said, um, surely these things are normalized. He's absolutely right, they are. Uh, alpha squared plus beta squared equals one. And it equals that and it's normalized that precisely because it actually represents a probability at that point. So the complex number itself, we call a complex amplitude. Um, and then you take the absolute value squared to find a probability of that particular state in the system. Um, uh, and equally, if you had uh, a multi-qubit system with say two qubits, you would have, if I continue to use Greek letters, say alpha zero zero plus beta zero one plus gamma one zero plus delta one one. Um, alpha squared plus beta squared plus gamma squared plus delta squared would all be normalized to one as well uh, for much the same reason. But it represents a probability that measuring the system results in that particular state uh, being the one that's found. Now, one of the obvious problems of this is that if you need to know the exact uh, state of your system, including all the complex amplitudes, um, you, you can't, <laughs> or at least not easily, because when you take a measurement, uh, it, all that goes away and you're just left with this probability um, and the particular state that it's landed in. So building up a more detailed picture of the original state requires repeated measurements, uh, for example, on an ensemble of states that you've prepared in the same, uh, same way. Uh, and it's called quantum state tomography. Uh, and it's a you know a big area, but basically the, the principle is that you either need to repeat the experiment multiple times to build up a picture of the actual state, uh, or you need to prepare a bunch of uh, quantum systems identically and then measure all of them to do the same thing. The key really is that measurement changes the state of the system. Uh, it's now in the state that you measured it in. And indeed, one can look at, uh, Going back to a little bit to what I was saying earlier about uh, open quantum systems or, or noisy systems, one way you can model this is by assuming that um, the environment effectively takes random measurements of your system at some interval um, and you know collapses, as we we say, uh, the system state to some particular one. Um, the implication here is that for us uh, looking to to emulate a quantum system or indeed to make use of an actual quantum computer is that uh, it's very difficult to do data input and output um, so if you have some particular state uh, that you're simulating on a quantum computer the chances are you probably cannot know um, or you can't easily output the entire state because it would be an absolutely huge file right you need to think of of measurements that you can make um, ideally, like one measurement that you can make that will tell you all the information that you require to extract from the, the solution that you found. Um, or you need to be prepared to do this quantum state tomography and take many, many readings. Uh, and the same is true with a physical quantum computer. You need to be able to uh, somehow extract the, the meaningful information from the solution that you found. Uh, and that's not necessarily easy. Okay, so those are some of the, the kind of features of quantum physics that are particularly important to quantum computing. Um, so, and I've already explained that, you know, we, we're going back to the uh, sort of 1950s in terms of abstractions that we have for, for computing um, by changing, you know, at the very base layer, what a bit is uh, to a qubit. So the question you might have next then is, okay, fine, but then how do you program a quantum computer? And the answer is by writing a, a quantum circuit. Um, so what we do is we say we have some uh, register, a quantum register of qubits, um, much like a classical register of bits. Um, and then we apply gates to that register, uh, such as these on the left. So this is just kind of a summary of, of, of common gates used in quantum computing. Some of them are very analogous to, um, uh, to classical logic gates. So you might see there uh, sort of halfway down the controlled knot. Um, this is a, uh, a knot gate that is 
either applied or not, depending on the state of the, the control qubit. Um, okay, so that looks reasonably similar to the sorts of things you can have um, classically, whereas the Hadamard gate, uh, about a third down, um, is completely quantum. And what that one does is actually puts a qubit into a superposition state, uh, again, a bit on the, the input state that goes in, but it uh, creates a superposition state from the original one. Um, and that has no, no classical equivalent. Um, OK, so uh, though I should say there is um, a, a sort of open source attempt currently ongoing to, to create a sort of quantum assembly language. Uh, which enables imperative programming um, of uh, these quantum circuits. And so, I mean, I say that we have no abstractions to, to make use of and we're, we're just designing circuits. Now, we're a bit luckier than, uh, or doing a bit better than, than people were in the 1950s and 60s when they were developing classical computers um, in that, you know, we still have Python. So, most of the uh, ways of simulating uh, a quantum computer or even programming an actual quantum computer, um, the user will actually be using a, a Python library and, and writing Python to control it. But they are still um, describing using Python, uh, you know, a, a quantum circuit, uh, similar to a, an electronic circuit, but for quantum systems. Um, but this, uh, sort of quantum assembly language, the aim there is to create a common language for all these different um, uh, sort of slightly higher level Python libraries that describe uh, various gates, create a common language for those so that you can um, move more easily between different uh, quantum computer hardware backends if you have access to one um, or indeed different simulators. So we are starting to, to build these kind of um, standards and abstractions in that will become uh, extremely important and uh, are useful for, for making it easier to actually use a quantum computer when we have access to one. Um, but for now, uh, you know, doing quantum computing is designing a, a circuit. Okay. Um, so if anyone out there is a, a regular user of, of, of an FPGA, a field programmable gate array, you might not have much sympathy for this argument because, you know, you're in the same situation there. Um, but still, you know, there are starting uh, or sort of high level abstractions that let you use, say, C um, to to describe things and then it automatically generates the circuit for you are starting to appear. Um, and that's a stage we still need to reach for quantum computing. But I, I think we're getting there. Um, and you know, this work is ongoing, which is encouraging because uh, designing circuits is, is hard. <laughs> um, but yeah, at the moment, it's a very, uh, sort of old school imperative way of programming and that you have this register and you must transform uh, or apply gates to that register um, in order to change its state in order to get the result of your uh, problem or in order to get your sort of solution. Okay, so that's the kind of key principles from aspect of, of, of quantum physics. Um, we know what a qubit is and we know that we need to have a register of qubits and then we apply transformations to it using gates. Uh, and there's a kind of set of standard gates that people use to design circuits. Um, the next question that I'd like to try and answer is how do I actually emulate that on a classical computer? So Qubits are represented by a vector of complex numbers. So you can see on the right, I've got my good old alpha zero plus beta one state. Uh, and that is simply a vector, uh, a column vector that has alpha at the top and beta at the bottom. Um, each element is the complex amplitude for that state uh, with zero usually at the top by convention. Um, Complex numbers are represented by two floating point values, uh, and generally double precision is required, although it depends on your application. You may get away with less. Um, but you know, we would usually start with double precision. Uh, so that means um, one qubit needs two complex doubles, which is uh, two lots of two times eight bytes, because you have a 
double for the real component and a double for the imaginary component of each complex number. So essentially, every single um, amplitude uh, is represented by 32 bytes, and we store those in a vector. Um, now, single qubit gates, uh, also known as operators, uh, are represented by two by two matrices. Um, so we have this O with a hat on at the side uh, that represents that. Um, and you apply a gate to a state by simply calculating the matrix vector product, as we see at the bottom. Um, just a completely ordinary matrix vector product. Uh, and the result, which is another column vector of the same size, is the new state vector. And uh, now operators are also complex valued. So you need four complex doubles for a single qubit gate, which is 64 bytes. OK. Um, but the, the short story here is that basically it's it's matrix vector operations, right? That is how we um, <laughs> go about simulating in full um, a quantum state. Um, yes, good. I hadn't remembered whether I'd put this in as a separate slide, but I'm glad I did. Um, so then this really brings me to uh, the scaling problem. And this is where um, simulating a quantum computer, this is why it's hard. Uh, so two classical bits presented by two numbers, uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Uh, you, Those are the four possible states. So you just need to show those and you're done. The composite state is completely separable, a separable product of the individual bits. Um, meaning that you know there's no state that you can possibly put two single bits in that requires more than that okay um, it can always just be represented by the individual states of the two bits uh, and this means your representation scales like n so if i need to represent n bits i just need n numbers in fact i don't even need numbers i can actually just use n bits uh, on a computer um which is great uh you know that fits in memory really easily, as you might expect, given that the entirety of computing or classical computing is built on this abstraction of using bits. Okay, and we know that that is what is, um, you know, implemented on the the physical hardware at the very bottom um, is designed to represent bits. So it's no surprise that that's easy. Now, recalling what we said about the superposition principle and entanglement. We know that we have any linear combination of any possible states of the composite system uh, can be valid. And in fact, <laughs> there are valid composite states that absolutely cannot be represented as a separable, pro separable product. The, the upshot of which is that we do need absolutely a complex number for every possible composite state. And that means that your scaling is actually 2 to the n, where n is the number of qubits you wish to represent. So for 2, uh, you can see here, we have four complex numbers that we need to represent. Um, and this is bad. <laughs> okay, this is an exponential scaling. Um, and that hurts a lot if you're trying to, to represent a quantum state of any type uh, on a classical computer. So um, my background is, is not in quantum computing, but is actually in uh, open quantum systems. And we have exactly the same problem there, however, where, um, you know, these quantum systems can be in any one of these states, so we need to include them all. And you very rapidly run out of memory um, on, a, on a classical computer when you're trying to represent large systems. Uh, yep, it's, a, it's an issue. This is really the heart of, of why quantum computing uh, is, is difficult to do with a classical computer. So you might ask, uh, why do we not just use compression? So there is some good news there uh, for operators or, or gates. Um, they are actually typically quite sparse and generally get more sparse as they get larger. Um, so uh, they might even have a, a simple enough structure that you don't need to write them out at all. Um, by which I mean that you know the operator may well be structured in such a way that actually you know that you're only going to be multiplying a select number of elements from your state vector by certain values and you you know that so you can just do that and not have to create the matrix at all um so julian asks uh, if the scaling would drop to order n if run on a quantum computer and uh the answer is yes julian you can you can definitely represent uh, n qubits uh, with n qubits um 
the tricky part then is is of course still the IO if you need to get that information out in in classical form. But yeah, uh, for sure, um, the scaling should drop to order. And there is a, one caveat to that, and that is that um, we don't have a perfect quantum computer yet. In fact, we we have a limited number of, of what are called noisy intermediate scale quantum uh, computers. Um, and really what that means is the control is such that you can run things on them uh, to, to a certain depth. So you can have so many gates before your error grows too large and your results become meaningless. Um, one way around this is, is error correcting codes and fault tolerant quantum computing. Basically, what those require is typically that you sacrifice some number of qubits to use as as error checks for your your sort of data qubit, as it were. So what you then end up with is a situation where you have a certain number of physical qubits corresponding to one logical qubit. And in that case, um, OK, so in that case, your scaling is still order n, but there's a prefactor <laughs> prefactor in there that you might not like uh, anymore. But in terms of, of pure representation, uh, yes, as you would expect, you can you can represent n qubits uh, on n physical qubits, no problem. Um, okay, compression. Uh, yes, so good news for operators and, and gates. Uh, this isn't always true. Okay, you, you sometimes might be in a situation where you have to, or at least um, it's not easy to not just write out the whole uh, matrix. And then you're in a really horrible scaling situation because um, your operators scale in, in much the same way as your uh, state vector does, with the exception that it's a square matrix rather than a single um, sort of n by one vector uh, or two to the n by one vector. Um, but you know, there's a lot you can do there. Um, the one news is a lot worse as state vectors. Uh, they are usually not sparse for the states that we're interested in. Um, now, it's tricky because that may be obviously very dependent on your application, um, and you might you might happen to know, for example, that there's a certain set of states that you're never going to pass through on a particular quantum computation. But it's very hard to know that beforehand. Um, so it's always risky uh, to do any, to attempt any kind of compression that way, uh, and you always, you know, you have to be aware that because you're just applying transformations to a state, um, there's going to be states that you pass through that may be uh, more difficult to represent. There are ways around that too. You can you can try and combine your operations into one single one, for example, um, but then you kind of put more of the the complexity or the lack of sparsity in the operator, um, so it has its own drawbacks. Um, there is a more advanced technique for, for state compression called matrix product states, uh, which I always like to bring up because it's what I, I spent my PhD um, doing. Uh, and this uses SVD compression or singular value decomposition compression. Uh, and what that is, is you, you take a matrix and you separate it into three matrices. Uh, and the one in the middle just has um, values on the diagonal. And then you look at it and you go, OK, uh, and these are effectively weightings for the rows and columns from the, the first and last matrix. And you can say, OK, anything that has a, a singular value or a weighting below uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 3, or 0 0.001, for example, just throw away. It's too small compared to the rest. Um, it's going to have negligible impact on the overall uh, thing I'm trying to represent here. Um, so we'll just get rid of it. And then you get rid of the corresponding uh, rows and columns as well, and you, you compress your state. Um, Difficulty here is that there is a, a theory in quantum physics that basically says that if you do this compression, what you're actually doing when you throw away those states is you're throwing away the most entangled states. Um, and for quantum computing in particular, there's no good reason to believe that those states aren't important. So matrix product states are really successful um, for uh, finding the ground state of a, a closed quantum system, for example, which is so the ground state is just the lowest energy state, and it's the state that you sort of expect the system to be stable in. Um, and there's a really good theory that says that that is very unlikely to be a highly entangled state. So matrix product states are excellent for that. Um, 
but for quantum computing, they are uh, a lot less helpful in that regard. On the other hand, um, the amount of compression you can uh, apply here is is you know, very large, um, and it does actually let you potentially scale up to incredibly large numbers compared to doing a full state vector simulation. So there is a temptation always to try it. Um, and I think if you do need results, uh, it basically, because of bio aware, so you can always try it and you can see, but you all need a good reason to trust those results. So you'll need to try it out with a much smaller system um, first and, you know, you're going to have to hope that the state that comes out of your MPS calculation is the state that you expect. And um, there's a, okay, actually for quantum computing, it's probably not so bad. There's a few things you need to do to make sure that it maintains normalization and so on as well. Um, but it is doable, but it's not great for quantum computing specifically. Um, just by way of showing what we mean by SVD compression, uh, this image at the bottom, which is uh, a picture of Berwick Law out by North Berwick. I'm um, looking forward once the pandemic is over to being able to cycle out there again um, because it's beautiful. Uh, but you can see the image on the left is the full image. And here, the number of singular values is all of the singular values is 807. Whereas on the right, we've only kept the highest 10 singular values. And you can see actually it's a pretty good, okay, there's a lot of detail missing, particularly from the wheels. But um, you know, the basic shape is still there with just uh, 10 singular values. So um, it can be quite a powerful compression technique, but you need to understand what it is you're losing when you do that compression. And in the case of quantum states, it's entanglement. Yeah, okay. And uh, as I said here, the bottom line is if you do exact simulation, just do exact simulation. Okay. Okay, so that's kind of all the, the theory stuff out of the way. Uh, I'm sure some of you will be pleased to hear. Um, now I'm going to talk a bit about uh, kind of, you know, practically what we did or what I've done. Um, so the software that we are, uh, something I would recommend for emulating a quantum computer on Archer 2 right now is something called Quest. Uh, that's its logo on the right and the link to its GitHub there. It was developed at University of Oxford by the QTech Theory Group. Uh, you've done a great job. Uh, it's parallelized using MPI plus OpenMP uh, and can be GPU accelerated too. Now, from our point of view, what's particularly important is the MPI parallelization. So there are many um, quantum emulators out there, but not many that are parallelized using MPI, which is extremely important because it lets us scale across nodes. Um, so it's written in C and C++ uh, and by design, it minimizes the number of messages that are sent uh, at the cost of sending very large messages, uh, which is essentially the cost of one additional qubit's worth of memory. So uh, in theory, you go one qubit further um, than you can with Quest, but you know, you're going to be sending a lot more messages to do that because they'll need to be kept smaller. Uh, there's all the information you could possibly want in this great paper that I've got referenced at the bottom. Uh, any slides will be available later along with this video, I think. Um, so feel free to go and look at that if you're, you're interested in knowing what their uh, MPI parallelization strategy was. Um, I actually didn't read that paper until after I'd done a bunch of tests, and I wish I had, <laughs> uh, because it, you know, A, it made sense of all the, the testing I've been doing, and, and B, um, it's really good uh, and really clear explanation. Uh, but yeah, Quest is what we recommend because it is scalable. Uh, it includes almost all canonical gates and you can specify your own. You do need to beware um, of very wide arbitrary gates and multi-threading. There's a little warning in the documentation, which you can find basically because it takes a copy of the, uh, the gate for each thread. Um, so if you've got, you know, if it's a, a matrix that covers a lot of qubits, so it's quite a wide gate, uh, you will run out of memory. Uh, so one thing to keep in mind, um, Certainly, if you're interested in uh, going to as many qubits as possible, and probably just in general, I haven't really done the actual profiling to check this yet, but um, given that uh, we think that uh, Slurm on, on Archer 2 is particularly well set up for doing hybrid uh, calculations with MPI plus OpenMP, um, 
there's no reason to believe that you'll you'll get much better performance, at least as far as I know, um, by playing tricks using multiple MPI processes to match to NUMA regions, for example. Um, uh, basically, just use one MPI process per node uh, and run 128 open MP threads. Uh, I've checked, and it absolutely gets the benefit of using more threads per MPI process, uh, but it's par the way it's parallelized, um, so it scales within a node. Um, and then if you just use one MPI process per node, you get the most you can out of every node, because really what you want is the entire memory to be available. If you start adding more MPI processes, then uh, you lose access to higher levels of qubits because it has to um, because it has a strategy of, of sending large messages between the two, um, and even even if the MPI processes are on the same node, the way it's written at the moment, it will still be doing copies that you don't want it to do. So um, it absolutely works best if you just have one MPI process per node and 128 open MP threads. Um, there is a power of two restriction on the number of MPI processes. Uh, and thus nodes, if you're sticking to this one MPI process per node, um, that uh, is not so bad as it sounds. Um, it does allow a lot of uh, optimizations uh, in terms of the way that you know, gates are applied, for example, um, and the hood, because they know that there's always going to be a power of two number of nodes, and therefore the state vector will be split in uh, by a power of two, and you know the state vector itself. Uh, is a power of two number of amplitudes. Um, so that all helps and makes some of the, the underlying logic a lot easier and allows for less bookkeeping. Um, and also, you know, to get one more qubit, you're always going to need to double the amount of memory that you're using anyway. So um, no matter what base you're changing from. Uh, but, you know, keep that in mind. So you need to run on uh, one, two, or four, or eight, or so on uh, number of nodes. And it's not currently centrally available in Archer 2, but it's it's uh, really easy to build. Um, you know, uh, well done to uh, the development team um, at the University of Oxford because they had absolutely no problems getting it built and run on Archer 2. Um, but if there's a lot of demand, if a lot of people are using it, then we'd be uh, happy to install it centrally. Um, Yes. OK, uh, just to say a little bit about the, the test code that I actually ran using Quest. Uh, it's uh, in terms of things you can do with a quantum computer, extremely boring. So all I did was just implement a quantum Fourier transform uh, or an n qubit all zero state. Um, this has the handy feature that the result is to place every single qubit in a state 0 plus 1, just as if I had only applied a single Hadamard gate to every qubit. Um, uh, which is boring, but really convenient because it means the results are easy to check. So uh, you know, I just need to see that the probability of every single state was the same, uh, and I'm you know, and correct, um, and I'm done. Uh, so the circuit is just here on the right. Uh, well, it's the circuit diagram, I should say, um, for the quantum Fourier transform. Um, so it's very simple. Uh, it does not have a huge depth of gates. Um, Gate depth, we haven't talked about that much yet, but um, broadly speaking, the number of qubits sets your memory requirements, and the, the depth of gate sets your runtime. Um, but the total number of gates was still uh, of the order n squared, um, so it wasn't completely negligible either, and at least scaled up with the, the size of the problem. Um, and during the simulation I was running, it assumed n perfect logical qubits. So there was no noise simulation on top either. Um, so this is really getting, we're packing as many qubits as I could into <laughs> into the available space, um, and just running a very simple uh, test circuit. Okay, uh, and here are the results of that. Um, so first of all, let's talk about the stuff on the left. Um, so here you can see uh, the blue dots. The blue dots are if you take the total memory required by the state vector um, for n qubits, where uh, you know the number of qubits is on the y-axis. Uh, how many nodes could I fit that on? Uh, and that's all that uh, graph is showing. And I've got the log two number of nodes. So you can see um, uh, it goes from from two up to uh, 512 nodes. Um, and the orange dot is the uh, number of qubits. 
that I ran. Now, actually, everything uh, along that bottom line of orange dots on the left, you can ignore. What that actually is is just me running my weak scaling, which is the results on the right. The interesting ones are the last three. Uh, and you can see that on um, uh, two to the seven nodes, we were able to run uh, a 39 qubit simulation. And you know, in theory, if we were able to make use of all the memory space just for this, we could fit only 40 qubits in. So as expected from the, the paper by Quest, it's one fewer. Um, and you know, that uh, pattern just continues up. Uh, and in fact, I tried it on, on other machines with the same amount of RAM, uh, so 256 gigabyte per node, which is what uh, Arch2 has. Um, and it carries on the, the whole way up to that point as well. Um, so it's great. You can very easily predict uh, how many nodes you need to, to simulate n qubits, um, which is wonderful. So we managed to get 41 uh, on 512 nodes. Uh, for context, as I say that, um, Google Sycamore processor was 53 qubits. Uh, that is well beyond what we'll manage to fit on, on Archer 2. <laughs> but 41 is still pretty good going. Uh, the record is somewhere around the mid 40s. Um, and yeah, so the, the, the overall state vector for that 41 qubit uh, simulation is, is 35.18 terabytes um, of RAM just for the vector. Um, so I'm really happy with these results. Uh, you know, it gives us some fairly serious um, emulation capability. You know, you're never going to win. Okay, it's absolutely clear. Uh, quantum computing has always already outpaced what we can manage um, to emulate classically. Um, but still, if you're in the business of designing quantum algorithms or researching quantum algorithms, it's nice to be able to run. You know, as large as you can without having to have access to an actual quantum computer just yet. Um, so this is great. Um, on the right, we've just got the weak scaling results, which is all these 32 qubit runs. You can see that I did. Uh, and you can see that the scaling is very close to ideal. Um, so the ideal is just uh, the amount of time it took to run on one node divided by two each time. And you'd see that actually sticks pretty close to that running the same circuit. Um, so it scales really well. You can get to a lot of qubits, uh, and we're very happy. OK, um, so the number of nodes for n qubits, uh, you can calculate just with this 2 to the n minus 32, uh, or taking the ceiling of 2 to the n minus 32. 32 is actually the number of qubits you can emulate on a single 256 gigabyte node. Now, that's not actually true. You can actually get to 33 in a single node because you don't have to use MPI, so you actually don't um, need to to worry about this extra memory that you're using for message passing. Uh, if I just go back on one side quickly, what you then might notice, oh, OK, you won't because <laughs> I don't have it here. But actually, you need to go up to um, to four nodes, I think, before you really start to see the benefit. Um, so you can run 33 qubits on one node or two, um, uh, but you need to get to, to four nodes before you can run 34. Um, yeah, but so that's worth keeping in mind if you are planning on, on running these sorts of simulations in Archer 2. But it's you know very formula for looking at how many qubits you can possibly run on on any given number of uh, sorry for n qubits. How many nodes will you need? Uh, and then the reverse calculation is, is similarly simple for the number of qubits you can fit on n nodes. Um, it's the floor of of log two plus thirty two. Um, now, in theory, once Arch2 is fully installed, we should be able to emulate up to 44 qubits on 4,096 nodes, um, which again is, is great. The one thing to keep in mind there is that is obviously a very expensive simulation. Uh, and where this might cause you a problem is if you are running a circuit that requires you to do the state tomography and therefore needs multiple runs. Um, that's going to be a bit trickier. But if you do, can have something that you just need to run once, you can probably uh, quite feasibly do that uh, on Archer 2 up to 44 qubits, which is amazing. Uh, and just uh, in case it's useful for anyone who's planning on filling out a TA, um, obviously, if you have any questions, you need more detail on this, do get in touch. And we're always happy to help. Uh, but on average, a single qubit gate where the, the memory is fully loaded takes about three seconds um, on, on Archer 2. Um, so that's when you're running the maximum number of qubits you can on, on the number of nodes you've got. 
Okay, so I've talked about uh, Quest a lot uh, and shown the work that we've done using Quest. Um, just to show it, we're, we're not shilling for Quest here. Um, Chris Git fans can rejoice. An MPI parallelized version uh, has been developed. However, it's not yet in the release. Um, so it's on their GitHub, uh, and I tried it, and it uh, did not build when I try it, tried it. Uh, but again, it wasn't in the release branch. It was just on their development branch. So I'm sure that will be fixed soon. And once it is in release, we'll be more than happy to put it through its paces in Arch 2 um, and see how many qubits we can we can get to and see what the performance is like. Uh, again, there's a really great paper about how this has been achieved, uh, which you can find um, at this link. OK. Um, and so yes, yeah, once that's available, we'll, we'll look into it. Um, and I see I'm, I'm actually running slightly over time, so I'll, I'll try and hurry up through this. But um, you may well be wondering what you no, know, we've got this amazing emulation capability. What are we going to do with it? Well, uh, as a center, EPCC is interested in applying novel compute to real world problems. Um, so what we're really interested in doing at the moment is working to understand where quantum computing can be applied and what the benefits might be. Now, that's very difficult to quantify at the moment um, because a lot of the time, you know, the argument or the the information you can get out of that is a, a complexity, a computational complexity argument about why a particular algorithm is better. Uh, and that may not always translate into real world performance gains. Um, you know, there's a lot, a lot that goes into to making uh, a kind of uh, accelerator actually do the work that, that you need it to do. Uh, and people who've worked with GPUs and, and FPGAs will be very familiar with the kind of problems that that you might face. And here we have the extra issue that uh, I.O. is extremely difficult um, because we're essentially translating our data into a completely different computing paradigm at, at both ends. Um, so, But still, we can look at uh, these computational complexity arguments, and we can try and guess at, um, you know, whether or not quantum computing may be beneficial to a particular area. And we're also interested in how it can be integrated with classical HPC. And again, this comes back to a lot of work that we already are involved in um, on uh, programming models for heterogeneous systems. We know how hard it is to actually program uh, a system with, with different types of accelerators in it. Um, and we expect that that's not going to be any different for quantum computing. It may well be much worse. Um, so that's certainly an area of interest for us. Now, we're working in collaboration with the quantum informatics group at Edinburgh. We're very lucky to have them uh, in ordinary times just across the, the bridge from us, uh, over in the, the informatics forum uh, across from the Bay Center. Uh, and so we've got uh, a few projects that we're currently um, uh, working on or proposals that we're working on with them, as well as uh, we're already supporting some of their, their students uh, or researchers um, on some of our other uh, compute systems. Which I'm really pleased about, uh, and in fact, the the thing that really spurred this the the start of this work happening is that EPCC is now involved in a much wider collaboration between the University of Strathclyde, University of Edinburgh, and the University of Glasgow, focused on applied quantum computing. Um, we don't have a name just yet. It's it's that new uh, newer center, or we do have a name, but it's changing. Um, but hopefully, at some point soon, we'll be able to uh, to tell you what that's going to be called. Um, and we'll have a new website to share for it. But uh, so for me personally, this is a really exciting uh, opportunity to get involved in, in quantum computing. Um, and you know, EPCC has the benefit of, of years of HPC expertise um, and computing expertise in general that we're able to, to bring there, as well as the emulation capability that we can use to support algorithmic research. And then for our own purposes, we're really excited to be investigating how quantum computing can be applied to uh, the sorts of things that all our users on, say, Archer 2 uh, and all our other machines are already doing. Um, you know, we'd love to know if quantum computing can benefit them um, and hopefully one day be able to provide them with uh, some uh, or with a quantum computer to actually use. Um, OK, so the, the summary then is that quantum computing is hard. Uh, emulating quantum computers is also hard. Uh, but using Quest, we can emulate a 41 qubit quantum computer on the Arch 2 4 cabinet system. Um, and hopefully, I uh, 
explained enough of the quantum computing to you, um, impressed by that as I am, <laughs> if not as excited. Um, a scalable version of Crisket is coming soon, which I think is really great news as well. Um, and EPCC is rapidly increasing our involvement in quantum computing uh, through its collaborations with partners across the UK and, and hopefully beyond as well. Um, but if you have an application that you think might benefit from quantum computing, uh, feel free to get in touch. Um, we'd be happy to hear from you. And uh, as there's really a, an open area for us is, is where can this be used? We'd love to know more. Uh, and thank you. I think that's that's everything. Um, so if anyone's got any questions, uh, feel free to ask in the chat. Great. Thank you very much for that. Uh, very interesting talk, Oliver. Uh, as Oliver has mentioned, please feel free to uh, ask any questions in the chat. Also, if you want to put your hands up to ask your question out loud, I'm more than happy to accommodate that. Um, to give people one quick moment to come up with their, oh, there's already a question, so I don't even need to do that. So David has a question, which I'm happy to read out if yeah. that helps. No, sure. So, so David's question is, will Quest have the same memory constraints as Quest? And so will we still be limited to 41 qubits, more or less? Uh, the answer, David, is that I need to go back and carefully read their paper uh, and or uh, just try it <laughs> to find out. My guess is, um, I think, I think that they take a different messaging strategy that means that we might be able to go one more. Um, so we might be able to do 42 with Quiskit, but I don't know uh, until we try it. I wouldn't expect it to be less. Uh, so Julian asks, what's the highest temperature qubit at the moment? Uh, oof. Uh, room temperature, Julian, uh, if you count the ones using QKD which are photons. Um, in terms of the ones used for quantum computing, I'm afraid I don't know. Uh, as f There's probably some that are, because you get things like nitrogen vacancy uh, centers in diamond that are used as qubits. And they're um, much better for stability at the cost of, because they're so stable, they're really hard to interact with. So it's the kind of thing that might be useful as a sort of quantum memory because it's extremely stable uh, and therefore long lived by the stands of these things. Um, and I don't know if they require cooling or whether they're room temperature. Uh, but yeah, so the honest answer is, uh, I don't know in terms of quantum computing. Um, but certainly the ones that people use uh, as gates um, tend to be require cooling. So Arash asks the question for a specific problem, how slow is Quest on Archer 2 compared to a quantum algorithm on a real quantum computer uh, like the IBM one? Um, so that's a really good question, Arash, that I'm afraid I just don't have the answer to. Um, now it will always depend on how many qubits you're using on, on both. Um, but I, I haven't had the opportunity myself to to make use of a quantum computer to, to test it, basically. And I find the, the numbers for performance are quite hard to come by, possibly intentionally. <laughs> so I don't think that, that's a, a question we can really answer just yet. Or certainly I can't. Someone may be able to. Um, my guess is it depends on, on which bits you count as well. So I would imagine that the actual uh, running of the circuit is is faster um, on the actual quantum computer, but the I/O may more than make up for for that, um, depending on what you have to do. But it, it certainly is an interesting question, and actually, it's something that my MSc student um, is looking at uh, right now. May even be. It looks like he's not in this talk. <laughs> but yeah, good question. Right. Well, um, that looks like um, that was all the questions that people wanted to ask. I'd like to take one more uh, or to thank Oliver one more time for giving this very interesting talk. Um, it didn't last under 20 minutes. And uh, yeah. with that, yeah. <laughs> uh, I should have known that would like... too much. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, with that, I'd like to thank Oliver one last time. And uh, thank you all for coming to this Archer 2 webinar. Uh, you can find more information about the upcoming Archer 2 webinars on the Archer 2 uh, training page. 
at uh, archer2.ac.uk forward slash training. Um, and uh, I hope that you all have a good day. Bye.